Hello, and welcome to this enhanced podcast from Enlightening Science, the outreach wing of the Newton Project at Sussex University. We're dedicated to providing resources to help improve the understanding of Isaac Newton, his importance to both his own time and ours, his influence and his thought. My name is Pete Langman, and today I'm going to talk to you about the popularizations of Newtonianism in the 18th century. The lectures and demonstrations by Desagulier, Martin Hawkesbury and so forth may well be considered to be particularly masculine. Even now there is a bias in the sciences towards men, and it may seem reasonable to assume that in the 18th century, when women filled a far more home-based role than now, that the same would be true. Indeed, one may expect women to have had no interest in science whatsoever in this period. This expectation, however, would prove to be wrong. Quite apart from the famous examples of philosophically sophisticated women such as Laura Bassey, Madame de Châtelet, Lady Murray Wortley Montague and Lady Walpole, women, or at least women of a certain class, seem to share the interest of their menfolk in the new science. Indeed, Desagulli and Martin mention it in the prefaces to their respective works, the former noting that Newtonian philosophy was proving popular even among the ladies. While it seems that women did attend the lecture courses given by these august gentlemen, they were provided with texts designed for their own particular needs, as were their children. Examples of these include Harris's Astronomical Dialogues between a Gentleman and a Lady, Francesco Algarotti's Newton for the Benefit of the Ladies, and the anonymous eponymous Tom Telescope or The Philosophy of Tops and Bulls. Published in 1719, 1739 and 1761 respectively, these texts were what are generally known as popularizations of Newtonian philosophy, that is, Newton without the maths. Furthermore, as they did not rely on experimental demonstrations, they were suitable both for the nursery and the salon. Newton for the ladies and Tom Telescope were designed for ladies and young adults, but nevertheless employed very different strategies when it came to education. We'll start with Francesco Algarotti. Francesco Algarotti was an Italian courtier and experimental philosopher who not only performed various Newtonian experiments, not least the experimentum crucis with prisms which finally convinced the French that Newton was right about the heterogeneity of light when they visited the Royal Society early in the 18th century, but also harboured desires of becoming a man of letters. In 1737, the first edition of his Newton for the Benefit of the Ladies was published, handsomely bound in folio, a book designed, it seems, to take its place next to tomes such as Newton's Principia. Dedicated to Fontenelle, whose plurality of worlds helped to popularise Descartes amongst a female audience, and end Algarotti's plain about emulating, Algarotti's work took the form of a conversation between a chevalier and a marchioness as they while away the long summer days in a country house. Algarotti notes in his preface that women are known for favouring imagination over reason, a hangover from the Renaissance. As he says, I have endeavoured to set truth, accompanied with all that is necessary to demonstrate it, in a pleasing light, and to render it agreeable to that sex which had rather perceive than understand. And the chevalier first tickles the marchioness's Newtonian fancy by reading her poetry, poetry she soon wishes to be replaced by an explanation of Newtonian philosophy. The chevalier then leads the marchioness through various other systems, convincing her that they are correct, before finally arriving at Newton, the end result. The chevalier even explains Newton's great experiment with prisms, the experiment which ends with him splitting the spectrum into its component parts and then reconstituting it into white light with a lens. Newton for the benefit of the ladies is, to a degree, designed to explain and popularise Newtonianism without the need for physical demonstrations. It is not a lecture text, but what one might perhaps call scientific fiction. The first English edition was, appropriately, translated by an individual whom Dr Johnson said had the best Greek in the country, the not yet 21-year-old blue-stocking Elizabeth Carter. Her translation, published in 1739, was much admired, though the book's format, the smaller duodecimo, meant that it took its place not amongst the heavyweight tomes on the bookshelves, but amongst works of fiction. It was followed in 1742 by what was more an adaptation of Carter's translation than a new translation, a publication which not only suggests that the work was popular, but intimates that the Marchioness from the original was not considered feisty enough. Carter's Marchioness follows Algarotti in being very much the recipient of the Chevalier's wisdom, while the 1742 Marchioness questions, complains and practically barracks the Chevalier. Newton for the Ladies is a book which asks the reader to imagine 
rather than demonstrating or even explaining. This is the Chevalier talking to the Marchioness. Be pleased to figure to yourself a chamber entirely dark, a chamber in which, as Milton says, reigns darkness visible. This shall be our scene for the search of truth. The Chevalier then goes on to give instructions to the Marchioness about how to reproduce Newton's experiment in Crucis, the crucial experiment which proves Newton's theory. The Marchioness is expected to reproduce the experiment in her head with her imagination. The Chevalier does not demonstrate it. This differentiates it from other experimental lecturers and their demonstrative approach, as Algarotti directly targets what he sees as his audience's particular strength, the imagination. A very different approach is taken by Tom Telescope, the eponymous star of another popular Newtonian popularisation, this time for kids. It was subtitled The Philosophy of Tops and Balls, and initially at least saw the 11-year-old Tom lecture his classmates, primarily for their moral salvation as they all wanted to play cards, using toys to demonstrate Newtonian principles. Ostensibly the transcript of a series of lectures given by Tom to the Lilliputian Society, perhaps a counter-dig at Swift's Gulliver's Travels in which Gulliver visits Laputa, a satire on scientific institutions such as the Royal Society, Tom Telescope is officially merely collected and methodised for the benefit of the use of these kingdoms by their old friend Mr Newbury in St Paul's Churchyard. Awfully convenient that their friend just happened to be a printer and publisher of children's books. The conceit is similar to that of Gulliver, though is rather more direct in advertising its fictional status. It is interesting to note the different authority figures in the two works. In Newton for the Ladies, it is the Chevalier who is the disseminator of knowledge, while in Tom Telescope it is young Tom himself who commands the audience. An audience consisting of his schoolboy peers, the Countess of Setstar, the Countess of Twilight, the Duke of Galaxy and the Lady Caroline. Apart from the obvious difference in figures of authority, there is another difference between the two works. Where the Chevalier makes his audience imagine the experiment, Tom actively demonstrates. Tom Telescope, as a work, is preoccupied with the use of instruments in the service of education. The Countess of Setstar, for example, remarks on the impossibility of teaching philosophy without suitable equipment, without being able to give a demonstration. And when she ushers the children to the observatory, it is so that they might have the use of proper instruments. Similarly, when Tom is challenged by Lady Caroline to prove that air has the property of spring, the Duke protests that he cannot do without the use of proper instruments. Young Tom runs through five themed lectures of matter and motion, of the universe and particularly of the solar system, of the air, atmosphere and meteors, of mountains, of minerals, vegetables and animals, and of the five senses of man and of his understanding. Perhaps surprisingly, Tom touches on ethics as he describes experiments. This is most apparent when he discusses the air pump. One of the more common experiments carried out with this piece of apparatus was the placing of an animal, usually a bird, inside before evacuating the vessel of its air. The bird would collapse as if dead. Often, upon allowing the air back into the vessel, the bird would recover, only to be suffocated again when this experiment was repeated. More often than not, it would eventually die. This is the experiment you can see in the Joseph Wright of Derby painting, an experiment with the air pump. Tom was discussing the air pump and its uses, how it can demonstrate that the transmission of sound relies on the presence of air, and how its resistance allows for birds to fly and ships to sail, before stating that, above all, air is the principle which preserves life, both in plants and animals. There is no breathing without air, and you know, when our breath is stopped, we die. Then he deviates from the demonstrative bent. This is one of those truths that are called self-evident, because it is universally known and needs no confirmation. But if a demonstration be thought necessary, you may have it in a minute by pl placing some living creature into the air pump. Now, you may think that animal welfare is a new concern, but then we read on. But it is cruel to torture a poor animal, so said Lady Caroline, and violently opposed the experiments being tried. But as all the rest were for it, the Duke was willing to gratify their curiosity, and therefore told our philosopher that he may try the experiment with a rat, which they had caught in a trap, and if he survived it, give him his life for the pain they had put him to. The rat suffers an agonising time, but ultimately survives. 
These two works, though they do fall broadly into the same category, that of popularizations of Newtonian philosophy, do take markedly different approaches to the same problem, how to use the proven techniques of the experimental lecturers without having the luxury of the experimental apparatus being at hand. While Tom Telescope describes the lecturer as he demonstrates each particular experiment, Newton for the ladies relies on the imagination. Both works, however, promote what they term the Newtonian philosophy as the preeminent way of describing the world about us. This enhanced podcast has been an enlightening science production from the University of Sussex. The sound recordist, editor and producer was Pete Langley.